This is the shoulder of a cow. What most people don't understand is how many steaks actually come from a shoulder. So today, Brent's got his apron on, and we're gonna show you where every steak comes from on the beef shoulder. It turns out that most of the most tender muscles on the animal actually come from one of the most hardworking parts of the animal. This has more complexity than any other muscle group on any animal, and it's the thing that we don't let our butchers touch for months. So how are we gonna do this, B? We are going to break this down the meat hook way. First cut is to just take the foreshank off. So the foreshank, as we know it, is mostly used for braising. I mean, you get some really, really good soup bones out of it as well. While this is great for many things, it is not a steak. Do not grill this, so we're gonna put it aside. Chuck it. Next cut, we're just gonna take the bottom half of the ribs off. These are continuation of the short ribs, but aren't quite as meaty or fatty as the short ribs. So we're just gonna take them off and use them as trim. Do you ever think about when you have like, when you're doing this, like it might skip and you'll saw into your thumb? I think about that all the time. Just sawing through the bone or not sawing through any meat. As you can see, Brent's just following the line that's naturally there. The knife barely even needs to touch it. This is just a natural seam, and this is something as you learn butchery more and more and more, you find all these natural seams showing you where the muscles go. So again, not a steak, going to the side. Next up, we're going to take the entire spine out. This is probably one of the hardest cuts to learn just because it is so tricky and everything underneath it is sellable steak. This is one of the most important parts of butchering a shoulder because right underneath all of these neck bones are some of the best steaks, some of the most tender steaks we're gonna find on the animal. This is one of the reasons why it takes so long for people to get the skills built up enough so that they can be breaking down a shoulder. We don't always get the animal with the spine intact. There's a law about if the animal is over 30 months, you have to have the spine removed for fear of mad cow disease. With pastured animals, that is 99.9% .9 not gonna happen. But the good thing about having the spine intact is it protects all of those steaks. It's also exceedingly different for a processor to take out the spine without cutting into the steaks even a little bit. So this way, we get the fully intact steak. That was just the cut to take off the feather bones and the first part of the neck. You saw how hard it was for me to do that with a five inch knife. If this animal is over 30 and the processor has to take the neck out with a huge saw, that's gonna be way harder and obviously not get the same amount of yield on the steak itself. Now that the feather bones are off, we're gonna take the rest of the neck out. That's a beef neck, definitely not a steak. All right, let's move on. Let's get into some steaks. So the first subprimal we're gonna deal with is going to be the chuck roll. Right now, Brent is peeling off what we call the Delmonico, which is a configuration of four different muscles. You'll see it sometime as the chuck eye steak, chuck eye roll, chuck roast. I would say it's in Brent's top three steaks. Hey, number one. Number one? Number one. It's the eye of the ribeye and the surrounding muscles, which are all very, very tender as they're moving up into the shoulder. I think it's a very, very valuable cut that is kind of underrated. This is the whole chuck flap. We're going to turn this section into our Delmonico steak. So just to cut the Delmonico section, we're gonna split this more or less in half. This is our chuck or chuck roast. We're setting that aside because it's a beautiful roast great stew, not necessarily a steak. The Delmonico is my favorite steak because it is literally the middle ground between a ribeye and a chuck roast. So super flavorful, but not the most tender, which is something that I really love out of steaks. I don't love really lean, super tender muscles. I like them to be a little bit more toothsome. I'm gonna take a nice inch and a half off there, and uh, there we have our Delmonico steak. It doesn't look like a ribeye exactly. You have muscle separation here. You can see between each layer, and you can see there are different muscles all kind of grouped together. What this gives you is a little bit of more fat in between each muscle, so you're gonna have not a nice real big fat cap here, but you are gonna have a lot of intermuscular fat and a, a lot of really, really thin fats connecting all of these tissues together. So you get a really nice texture. Our next cut is going to be the Denver and the Sierra that's resting on top. It sits right underneath the Delmonico, also just gonna peel this back. 
The Denver, or sometimes called the underblade steak, is really, really good at medium rare. Unlike most steaks I find with grass-fed animals, the, the better texture is at rare. This one tends to loosen and toothsomeness at medium rare. So right here is just a big old ugly piece of flat meat. Once we trim this down, we're going to get a Denver steak out of it. All we need to do to start is take off the Sierra. We can get a better picture of the Denver. The Sierra uh, looks a lot like a flank steak, which you will see here in a second. Is it a flank steak? Oh no, no, it is not. Brent, what's your experience with a Sierra? Uh, don't even give it the time of day. All right. Sounds like the Sierra and I have something in common. So now to get to the Denver. The thing about seam butchery is that a lot of muscles will be directly next to the other one. One of them will be great and one of them will be not so great. So is the Sierra and the Denver. We really love the Denver. Sierra, not so much. This is our Denver. You just wanna take a good look at which way is the graining going. As you can see, there's some natural lines going that way, which means that we wanna be cutting that way. You can actually see that the muscle fibers are even larger on this steak, which is different than smaller muscle fibers, say on a filet. Larger the muscle fiber, the more you actually wanna cook it. Next up, we're just gonna attack the brisket. You can see there's this natural seam in what you would pretty much call like the armpit of the animal. And that's what Brent's following across, is trying to just get that seam all the way over. And that is what a brisket looks like before it's cleaned up. Do not grill this. It requires long, slow cooking in order to make it tender. Next up, we're just gonna do the shoulder clod. Oh, baby, we're getting into the good ones now. Ooh, right here is the terrace major, sometimes called the petite tender or the shoulder tender. And you can even see, like you can pretty much dig your finger underneath that steak. It's, the sinew's so thin. And then you have the clawed heart. The clawed heart is like the weather. It's really, really hard to predict. You never know what's gonna happen until you actually get there. So this one we always have to visually look at to see exactly how tender is the steak gonna be. We are going to trim out the petite tender and uh, cut some, what do you want to call them? Ranch steaks. R ranch steaks. Ranch steaks. Ranch. As I mentioned earlier, you can pretty much just like reach in there and you can find your line. You don't even need a knife to pull it apart. And I'm not using any pressure here really at all. There's your shoulder tender, terrace major, petite tender, whatever you want to call it. This is a small muscle, but it is super easy to cook and a lot of our customers' favorite steak overall. If you like a hanger steak, there's only one of those per animal. There's only two of these per animal. So super limited, but if you like the texture and it's a great value, like go to your local butcher, pick this thing up. Now that we have the Terrace Major, we're just gonna trim this up of the excess muscle that's all gonna go into stew or grind, and then we have our clod heart. It really depends on the animal, on if this is going to be tender or not. When you're a high volume processor, killing animals and killing the environment, you probably aren't uh, too worried about little things like old clod heart. But since we're a whole animal butcher shop, we need to find the value in everything, so we always try it out. So this is our ranch steak. We love it because we can actually get a couple consistent steaks out of the whole muscle. It really does matter animal to animal as far as tenderness, but this looks great. Similar to the Denver, that it has a little bit larger of a muscle structure, but find it, it's usually about on par as far as tenderness. Good weekday steak, easy, salt, pepper, put it in a pan, you're done. That's it. All right, almost at the end. This is the one, the flat iron. The second most tender steak on the animal after the filet. It's great at rare, it's great at medium rare, it's great at medium. Our actual shoulder blade flat iron steaks. You really can't mess this steak up. Great value, super tender, and uh, great flavor. From the butcher's perspective, it's also one of the hardest steaks to get clean because it is considered so valuable and our customers love it so much. We always wanna get it perfect, but it also has a very thick piece of sinew, kind of like the clod heart, running right through the middle, which makes it a little bit tricky to cut. This is another reason why we save the shoulders to be the last thing that people learn to butcher. You can tell just by looking at it now, 
It looks great. There's no fat. I don't care. You shouldn't care. This doesn't need fat to be tasting good. A lot of these steaks you're seeing today don't have a lot of fat. It doesn't matter. They have a lot of flavor because the muscles are being used so much. They don't need that fat as a crutch. So this flat iron, we sell whole. We recommend cooking whole and then slicing after. Great steak for salad. Ooh, Ooh salad. Healthy. Really easy to just cook two minutes each side, uh, hot grill, nice crust, keep it rare on the inside, slice it, done, it's fantastic. This is what is called the mock tender or the scotch tender. Do not let the name tender being in the title fool you, it is not tender. I like to say, make it a minute steak or make a mistake. Come on, what a line. Our last steak, this is the real underdog. By underdog, he means the worst steak on the animal. I don't know why the hell we're actually even doing this. It doesn't make any sense. It's not a good steak. You should throw it in grind. Ben's got a hair up his ass and he wants to grill it. So we know Brent's thoughts. That is what we're gonna cook. Mm. I'm not saying it's gonna definitely be good. I'm just saying I haven't had this in like four years and we're breaking a shoulder. I just want to try something new. I'm open to new experiences. I wish you were open to Save my hard more. earned money to oh go my to God. the local butcher shop. You've never buy earned your scotch. money. <laughs> You're true. Here we are at the end of our beef shoulder journey. Starting first, we have our ranch steak from the shoulder clod. Mmm, delicious. Next up, flat iron, lean, tender, easy to cook. Delmonico, like the ribeye, as those muscles are going into the shoulder, really, really good flavor. Shoulder tender or terrace major, also lean, tender, easy to cook. Sierra, it looks like a flank. Don't believe it. It's not. It's not. It needs to be cut really thin, really good for fajitas or good for stir fry. Mock tender, it sucks. Hold that judgment, we haven't cooked it yet. Last up, Denver. It's good at medium rare or medium, not at rare. It's also called the underblade or kind of a boneless short rib, but it's good. Beef shoulder. God, let's cook some steaks, B. So what steak do you want to cook? I think I want to do the Denver. Great choice. What steak do you want to cook? I still want to go with my A number one first round draft pick. Del Monaco steak. Totally good, and just because it's not a day that we work together if I don't torture you, I wanna do a little mock 10 or minute steak just to make you try it. Yeah. That's the enthusiasm I like to hear from my partner. So we're gonna take these steaks, we're gonna kick to the backyard, we're gonna grill them up, we're gonna eat some steak. We'll start with your favorite, Delmonico. Yeah, let's eat a steak. Let's eat a steak. Ooh. He's cutting the Denver. Oh yeah. He's cutting the minute steak. Mmm. Start with the favorite. Start with the favorite, let's go. Mm, 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 mm. I don't think it gets any better than that. Let's see. Mm. Great flavor, very Ooh. buttery. Buttery, actually even a little bit sweeter than the, than the Delmonico. Last but not least, let's do this. My number one. Come on, man. It's not bad. It tastes like liver. So? Yeah, okay, the mock tender is not great. But it is like, it's more tender than I expected it to be. Tough sell. I was expecting it to be a zero out of a 10. And I'd say it's a one and a half. That's okay. come, oh, that's way too harsh. That's at least a four. It turns out, steak from the shoulder are still great. Now, hopefully, you know a little bit more about the steaks you're getting at home and the complexity of the muscles that you're dealing with. Not every steak has to be a ribeye, New York strip, or a filet. There's a huge range of steaks out there. Get to know the texture, get to know the flavor, you can get radically different things from the shoulder. Go to your uncle butcher. <laughs> Tell him Brent and Brent say hi. Hey. Hi. Hi. 